Hey guys, my name is Mavi and I've spent the last 14 years in the plastic surgery and beauty industry, working alongside top board certified plastic surgeons. Now I'm an independent patient coordinator who doesn't work for any surgeon. This means I have unbiased reviews for hundreds of doctors and I can help you achieve the look of your dreams, whether that's a supernatural or a video vixen. I use my professional and personal plastic surgery experience to help you look and feel your best. Join in on the fun as I talk to plastic surgery experts, friends, and real-life patients about all things plastic surgery. Should be fun. Hey, guys. So guess who I have on the show today? I have Dana from IG Famous Dana. Hi. Hi. So, okay. Why is Dana on the show today? You guys, if you were to follow me on Instagram, you saw me post this week about go watch Filler Nation. And after you watch Filler Nation, go listen to Serial Fillers, Dana's podcast, and listen to like the insider information, like the background of how all of this happened. And you guys, I went and I did it and I was fuming. I was like, we have to record an episode ASAP. What the hell? So Dana, I'm so glad to have you on. And girl, what the hell? That's exactly what I was saying. And literally Sheridan and I were messaging immediately because we're like, oh, it's coming out. It's coming out. And we watched and we're like, what the hell? This is not what we signed up for. This is not what they told us. And also the fact that we filmed for so long, I filmed for six plus hours. She filmed for three days. The entire documentary is 22 minutes. Like what? They it was just so insanity. Much. They cut out so much because it wasn't what they wanted to say. We weren't giving them the sound bites they wanted. Unfortunately. I'm excited to get you on because I can't believe it. <laughs> Me neither. Like, girl, it was... Dana, what the fuck? That's so fucked up that they're like that. I honestly... So, like, the producer... I know we kind of, like, talked badly about her. But honestly, I think she just had no idea. She actually was nice. And she clearly didn't know anything it's about procedures. Edit it. Yeah. And really the person who really annoyed me the most, which I didn't actually have any one-on-one, like, you know, I didn't get to talk to her is the girl with like the colorful hair. That's like a, a writer for NBC news. Like she was talking with so much confidence about stuff that she doesn't know anything about clearly. Like she knows just enough to say buzzwords and like not enough. To actually be able to talk about it. And that's what was crazy. She was saying like influencers shouldn't talk about this because they don't know anything. And I'm like, girl, you don't know anything either. And it shows. (laughs) So, okay, hold on. You you can use any of this, by the way. Like I know we're pre-recording, but you're welcome to it. Thank you. When I saw, first I was like, okay, let me go listen to the episode. I was like, let me go be supportive and listen to the episode. And then I went to listen to it. And then I was like, wait, hold on. What the hell's going on? So then I went to watch the documentary and I was like, yeah, I can't believe that they were, they changed it around. Like this isn't in positive lighting at all. Right. And what Sheridan and I kind of think is that they maybe didn't know exactly where they were wanting to go with it. But after interviewing me, interviewing her, maybe we were too like positive. And they're like, well, this isn't interesting. There's like no friction here. Drama. Yeah. And so another thing is is that there's no like clear message, right? And we talked about that on the podcast. Like there is a little bit of a influencers are bad. They shouldn't be talking about this, but they don't really say why they don't really like even back up that message. So it just seemed like they filmed all this stuff and then they're like, okay, what are we going to do with all this information? We need to make this dramatic. Something. Let's just make something out of it. Right. Well, okay. So. For the episode, what I was thinking, because, the, you know, what I'm trying to do on Instagram is like exactly what they're talking shit about, like right. bringing attention and like how are it's completely. I love that mug. <laughs> <laughs> I want one. It's from Married to the Mob. So I love it. I want one. And it's hot pink. It's matte hot pink. So it's super cute. I love it. I want one. For for that purpose, exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> but so what I was thinking was like, okay, well, like even for doctors, well, like you have you seen what happened with Dr. Roxy up in Ohio, like her medical yeah. license was suspended. 
Yeah. And I'm kind of on that like fence of how much is too much? When is it inappropriate? Like how many, how far are we pushing to be in the operating room that we're putting the people's like, I don't think they should be recording while they're operating, period. I, I think that, so when I did my surgery, I they had a separate person who was in there to take just a couple quick videos and pictures, but she was not allowed to talk. She had to like stay a certain whatever. So they do like have some distance. video. Yeah, some video and she was scrubbed in and everything, right? And so they have like some video of like, he was pulling out like a fat pocket out of my mm-hmm. eyelid. And like a little bit of the lipo, like whatever, but a doctor, a surgeon filming? No, no, ma'am. Like we are no, not. So I think what they were she doing. was doing. She was, she was she talking to the camera. Talking to the camera. And not paying attention. Yeah. Did you read the document? Yeah. So I was reading yeah. the document and it said that she was talking to the camera while she was doing the liposuction. And looking instead of looking down because you have to keep visual. Yeah, you have like, to look at what you're doing. Yeah. So I'm kind of like on that fence because I feel like we're pushing it a little bit too far, but at the same, so it's like, we're pushing too far into the operating room. And at the same time, what I, what we're trying to do is educate our consumers, right? Because they want to know what's going on over there. Like, but it's all this like transparency that we don't have because for example, like Dr. Roxy, she seemed great. The thing was, and you know, you know exactly what I'm going to talk about, like the older doctors and the younger doctors and how they're kind of like, right. This is inappropriate. And the younger doctors are like, well, this is what they want. Yeah, people want to know. Yeah. But the, the difference with Dr. Roxy is that she was told multiple times to stop and she didn't stop. Like it's a mistake if you do it once, right? Maybe twice it like, cause you're trying to do it differently, a better way or whatever. And you're still mm-hmm. messing up, but I'm sorry. After a certain amount of time, you are just outright putting the patients. At um, risk. Yeah. Putting them at risk. Like you, you're putting yourself above their needs. And at the end of the day, you're supposed to be caring for your patient before you care about literally anything else, anything else in your practice. So she will never not be wrong to me because of that, because they warned her. She got warnings and she still said, I'm going to do it anyway. No, I'm going to, I'm going to perform for TikTok anyway. Yes. Which, so then that's where kind of like, I'm okay for this episode that I want us to do where I'm like, okay, well, they're shining the light so bad on us, on these people on Instagram who are trying to spread information and blah, blah, blah. But Literally, if we don't look, do it, there's nothing. There's no information. Yeah. There's no information. A hundred percent. And the, the thing that I have a really big issue with was that they're saying that influencers shouldn't talk about their experiences with plastic surgery because they're not giving the risks and warnings. And I was like, first of all, I don't want them to talk as an expert. I want them to talk as a person having an experience because they're not trained to talk about exactly all the things that you learn about and informed consent. They're not trained to know who's the right person for it and who's not. When is this the right thing to do? All they can say is, is this is what was right for me. And this is what steps I had to take to do this. And this is what my recovery process was like. This is what the cost was, whatever they want to talk about whatever they want to share. personal experience. I don't want influencer being like, okay. And they have to say, not even they have to say like, all of these things can go wrong and all of these things are possible. And these are the people who shouldn't have this done. Like they don't know that. That's none of their business to be spreading anyway. Right. Exactly. Because that's where we're going to actually get misinformation. All I want you to talk about is you got lipo. Why? Where? What did it look like? What did it feel like? What is the result? That's it. Where'd you go? I don't even want you to be like, well, I got lipo here because... The way that, you know, like talk, talking about it in like those broad terms, like, you know what I mean? Like, I just want you to tell us your personal experience. Just tell us that you had something done. That's right. it. Like literally, that's all we need to know. Just tell us you had something done right. because sometimes when, like, for example, if a follower is watching like Bella Hadid and they're like, oh, she's so beautiful and everything's natural. And then it's like, it's really not. Mm-hmm. It's really not. And if if they could, there just be a little bit more transparency as to what is really real and what's fake and what are they doing? What are you doing to get there? Because I want that. Right. Right. I mean, 
at, at the very minimum, just talking about that, I get work done. Absolutely. But there are, they were showing influencers that show their journey and they were like, they shouldn't be doing this. And I was like, no, absolutely. They should like this starts the conversation to where now I know what procedures may be out there. I can go talk to my doctor, my provider, whatever it is. And then it is up to them to give me informed consent and tell me the risks and, you know, all those things. That's what the consultation process is for. Exactly. Like, they were making it seem like if I post my lip filler journey, people are just going to go get lip filler. And the person that's giving them is just going to be like, okay. And just <laughs> like, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way with the people that we associate right. with. But there's, well, I think what the light they were trying to like bring in the documentary or in the video was that there's uh, people that shouldn't be doing it. Period. True. But they don't, but they don't talk about that. They don't make the comparison and they don't talk about like, how do you find a qualified provider? And that was another thing that bothered me. Like, I feel really bad for that girl. I already forgot her name. Desiree, Mm -hmm. Desiree, like, you know, whatever you want to do to your body, whatever, as someone in this industry, the way she went about it completely incorrectly, that is not something that, and I said, no one should ever ever do this. Yeah. I'm not in support of how she did it. You know what? She did it. I'm not going to talk shit about her body, but they put her and Sheridan, like as if they were two people doing the exact same thing and on the same like path. And it's like, no one went about it the illegal way going to like back alley, like all the things that we always say, do not do. You are so putting yourself at ridiculous risk here. This is how people die. Sheridan literally got too much filler and then was Decided getting- Decided she wanted to take it out. Yeah, and then start again. And you know, now that she, you know, she had filler blindness for a little bit and wanted bigger, bigger, bigger. And until it was like, okay, I need to dissolve this and start over. Those are two very, very separate journeys. And even very I heard like- different biggest like her lips they weren't like outrageous they weren't illegal like it was just too big for her face too big for her face and okay so so that's what I was thinking for this for this episode for us to kind of really talk about the Instagram community and what we're trying to do and how this like this documentary shed like such ugly light and I I think it was like targeted at boomers like these people on Instagram and they're doing all of these terrible things and it's really not like that it's gonna get like illegal butt shots so (laughs) it's sad but I felt so mad I was so mad when I was watching I was like I cannot believe this this is terrible. I know. And I felt really How did bad you feel? Sure. So how did you feel while you were watching the documentary or like when you were watching it for the first time and you're like kind of realizing, oh shit, this isn't the light that I was thinking that it was going to be in. Right. This isn't what they pitched me. I mean, honestly, like they didn't do me dirty the way that they did Sheridan, Desiree, some of these other people. Like they still had me as like an expert and they have me where... It sounds like I'm kind of anti, like when I'm like, no one should ever get that injected into their butt or anywhere, which is true. I stand by that statement. And I even, they cut that part out because I mean, cut parts of it out. Cause I was like, first of all, let's call it what it is. It's illegal because they're biopolymers. That is, you know, silicone that's just in your body can be reabsorbed into different tissues and it can cause some serious, serious issues, including death. No one should ever do that. Nowhere, not your lips, not your butt, not your boobs. You do not inject free silicone into any part of your body ever. And that was like my whole quote. And they like cut it to where I was just like, no one should ever. And I was even laughing because they're like, so what do you think about her illegal butt shots? And that's when I was like laughing. And I was like, first of all, let's call it what it is. It's bipolymers. And, you know, and I was laughing anyway, and it, it almost made it seem like I was on their side, but it's, I don't know. My first initial reaction was this, the flow is weird. I don't understand their message. They're comparing a regular like lip filler and dissolving journey, which they don't even touch on the dissolving journey part to illegal procedures as if it's the same thing. Then they touch on 
you know, possible like racial issues that can coincide with some of these trends, but like just jump into another topic right after that. And it's just like jarring and it, it doesn't I flow. think it was more like dramatic TV. Right. Necess- right. Like needing something exciting for the show. Right. And all of it, the part that bothered me the most was, was still the girl that works for NBC News, I guess, the pop culture writer. And she was like, they're bypassing regular like marketing agencies. I was like, yeah, like they're using influencers instead of marketing agencies. Influencing is marketing, first of all. So don't make it seem like it's not a leg of of marketing. And she's like, you know, the influencers aren't going to have the best interest. And I was like, because marketing agencies do? Are you joking? You know what? And I also want to point out like that there's a difference between going on, on Instagram and, oh, be trying to become an influencer and like for me, I'm a business that has a page on Instagram, right? My, this is my business and I'm putting it out on Instagram and I'm like, it's for my, my marketing. Right. But I think that it needs to be like separated. They're like, Oh, all of these people on Instagram, they're just influencers. And it's, I don't consider myself an influencer at all. I can right. my job. This is what I do. Like I am not trying to gain popularity just for for it like I have a mission I have a purpose behind it right it, it kind of makes me mad like I'm offended right but at the same time is that what they're getting wrong is that these are not all influencers who are being paid by anything like Desiree Sheridan they're not getting paid by Allergan or Galderma or anything when they're getting fillers like she's just showing that because part of being an influencer is showing your daily life and what you do But at the same time, doctors and surgeons, they do need to have influencers and other people that are willing to let their image be shown because it is such a taboo and private subject that people don't want their pictures out there. But that is how they, that is their bread and butter. That is how they advertise their services. Like who wants to go to a surgeon who they can, they can't see any pictures. pictures. Yeah. No one wants that, especially now when most of the work that we see is on Instagram, people are not going to websites to look at the boobs that they did, like they're going to check out your Instagram page first. So, and I said this a lot of times, if they do give anything, it might be a little bit of a discount, which is basically paying for your image. And they can, they do that for regular people. I know surgeons who are willing to give you a little bit of a discount or free Botox in addition to your surgery or something like that. If you let them use your before and afters on their social media and you sign your extra consents, like this is not a, it's not illegal. And so the way they're making it seem was like all of these influencers are just getting all this free surgery and then they're talking about it, but they're spreading misinformation just by being transparent about it. And then all of these people are going and suddenly getting work done. And it like, if you hear me at one point, one of the clips I'm saying, you know, people are acting like people are just now getting work done because of Instagram. We've been getting work done for like a hundred some years, like Marilyn Monroe had work done. Like yeah. um, Greta Garbo had work done. These people, we've had surgery around for a long time and regular people have been having surgery for decades. We're just talking about it more because our generation is talking about it more. We're not hiding it anymore. And they, they kind of mentioned, you know, they kind of use a little bit of that clip. That's where that came from was the question was, is social media causing more people to have surgery. And I was like, "Mm, well, we've been having surgery for a long time before social media. I think what it's providing is, hey, it's fine. Like my friend did it. Mm So-and-so did it. They're okay. They're not ashamed about doing it. So maybe it's okay. Maybe it's fine. If I I want to do it, I've been wanting to do this for a long time, but I was afraid or I was shy or I didn't know anybody who did it. Yeah. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, look, I'm watching somebody go through the whole thing. Like it's not maybe it's not as bad as I thought or it is as bad as I thought. I don't want to do, do it. Right. But right. at least you're getting like real time information and it's no doctor can give you that because right. they're not going through the surgery and they're not experiencing it. No matter how good they are, how well the office is like there's something that you can get only from somebody who's experienced it too. Exactly. Cause they can tell you, Oh, well, when I was, when I was going through this, this is what I did to help me with this problem that you're experiencing now. 
Because it also stops this feeling of like, oh my God, is this just happening to me? Like, what's wrong with me? Why am I not healing fast enough? Why don't I feel better? Like all of these things get to be like, oh, well, I'm just recovering a little bit slower. And it's totally normal. It's more open, more freedom, more accessibility to other people and information. Exactly. I love it though. Me too. I just, it it was just crazy because it's like, they took all of this information from me and they're like, "Mm, we're not going to use any of that because just like what you're saying, the more that people know, the better we can make decisions for ourselves. And I literally compared it to sex ed. I was like, studies show time and again, when people know what their options are, what risks are, what they can do to protect themselves, how to have safe sex, et cetera. We have less teenage pregnancy. We have less rape. We have less of all of these worse outcomes. We have also have people who enjoy sex more and are having more positive experiences. Right, right. And so it's the same thing with, I think, anything. I think anything that people can learn more about what the risks are, how to protect themselves, how to do it the right way or do, you know, find the best way for them is only going to make it better for everyone. And so talking about this stuff and people seeing more of it, they're able to find the right surge and they're able to find the right procedure. Sometimes people don't even know what procedure they need. They just, you know, heard something and they're like, oh, this is what I'm getting. And it's like, no, that's not the right procedure for you. What can they expect? How much does it cost? What is downtime like? What are the risks? And then they can make the decision for themselves. Which a lot of times, you know, you know, just as much as I know from being in the office with patients that they sometimes don't realize what they're signing up for. Right. I can't tell you how many times I've had a patient who later on after like post-op visit one after a tummy tuck, they're like, crap, I did not realize it was going to be like this. And it's Mm -hmm. like, even as much as we explain it in the office, you know, they only retain about 30% (laughs) of what they learn during our consultation. So it's normal for them to not grasp, but the more research they do once they go home and they're on Instagram and they're looking it up and they're finding what we're trying to do, I think is for them to find good information instead of all the crap information that is out there. Exactly. For safety. Right. So then why are they talking shit? (laughs) I don't know. Like, Like I said, even though their message seems to be like influencers shouldn't be talking about this, this is bad, it's all bad. They don't ever back it up with any reason. They don't ever say it's bad because people might go out and do illegal butt shots. Like they don't even make that connection, even when they're showing the girl who did it, not the way that we would ever recommend anyone to do it, right? Like they don't even like, like, why couldn't you have picked somebody who? had a massive weight loss, went through their transformation on, on Instagram, lost all the weight, went through the recovery. I mean, finding a surgeon is like showing their recovery, their transformation after a hundred pound weight loss or a 50 pound weight loss and how they're walking people through the journey. Like y'all could have picked, I'm sorry, not, not to knock on the girl that did get right shown, but I wish they would have shown somebody like who's going through the process and really being out there with information that's valuable. Right. I feel like they could have just picked some, like show. I think they wanted someone shocking. They wanted someone shocking. Her body is shocking. It is beyond even the most extreme of normal surgeries. Like even when we think about like the Kardashians and their extreme BBLs and their BBLs are very extreme. They're a lot of the surgeries they have are very extreme. It's still beyond that in terms of, you know, what she looks like. And she gave them the sound bites. I think they were looking for, like at one point she was like, yeah, every time I, you know, add to my butt or something like that, every time I do this, I get like 500,000 likes. So like they got the sound bites that they Mm -hmm. wanted from her. Like they're just, all these influencers are just getting all this work done for likes. And it's like, Theoretically, yes. Like when you look better, people will like your posts more. They will engage with you more. They will follow you. Like studies show that more attractive people do better on Instagram. That's just how it is, unfortunately. But they're equating it with almost direct. Like if I add, you know, more into my butt, suddenly 500,000 likes. And it was just a soundbite they were looking for. So it's like a shocking person 
saying shocking things. And that's why they picked her. Well, the good thing is, though, I think that seeing that and for me, it really burst my bubble, this bubble of that I lived in where I'm like, oh, everybody's okay with plastic surgery. Everybody's fine. And it's almost like, oh, it's a reality check. Like, no, they're not. Actually, they talk crap about people who have plastic surgery or they look down on it. It's like, and it's everything that I'm trying to work against Mm -hmm. that, you know, being in the industry, it's like everybody has procedures done. I know I see celebrities. I see attorneys I see everybody everybody yeah, regular everyday people regular I always people. say every single day you're walking around out in public you're passing by at least one person who's had something done like you have you yeah. there's someone in your life that's had it and you might not know they might not be telling you but someone in your life has had something done yeah and Point this like, documentary just burst my bubble of like oh crap like maybe there is a lot more work that needs to be done to counter this stigma that's being or this narrative that's being pushed out there girl you okay I've been really open about my surgeries I literally had a video where I was just talking about my eyelids my bluff and I was showing like before and after and I was saying like some people couldn't see but I was like showing really good before and afters for people to be able to see that I have more eyelid space and this guy comments on this video like yes I know I got life on my chin and my arms this video was strictly about my eyes and he goes you could have just worked out for my eyelids like are you joking like he is so mad he was annoyed that I got surgery when I could have just worked out and it's like you can't work out for your eyelids what the hell first of all I hate that you should have just worked out anyway period but eyelids Thanks for stopping by and leaving this amazing yeah. comment for me to laugh at later when I mm-hmm. when, come on. You great can't advice. Great advice. Great advice. Let me take it and but that's how let s- me shut all my stuff down and go right. take your advice and work out. Right. Like that's how stigmatized surgery is, is that even with something that absolutely cannot be fixed by lifestyle choices, that's still the option that's presented to me. No. No, that's ridiculous. And, and it's even harder when it comes to your body, like with me getting my arm lipo, so many people are like, you need to just work out like you keep talking about how you gained weight. Yes, I did. I have gained weight over COVID and I am and I've been losing weight. But my arms have always been bigger. And right now, my arms are smaller than they were at the same weight a few years ago. And people are just not understanding that, that lipo is not about weight loss. It's about re-sculpting your body, like changing the shape. And so it's even harder when it comes to that because people just swear if I just like did arm workouts, my arms would get smaller and, and they don't. It's just genetically, my arms are bigger. That's just where I hold all the weight. And so. you know what's crazy? I feel I had this conversation with one of my patients or one of my girls. She was She goes to see her... There, she has a therapist that she talks to and she was telling him about what she's planning to do and that she was working together with me. And she was kind of like justifying it like, oh, you know, I want to have a tummy tuck, but it's because of like my kid, like they stretched out my stomach and blah, blah, blah. And the therapist was like, hey, 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 like you don't have to explain it to me why you feel like you, why you want to have a tummy tuck. Mm-hmm. Like even if you're doing it just for vanity, there's no explanation that needs to be given. And ever since she had, I was like, you know what? I like, I've always felt that, but now I'm like, now I'm going to start saying it out loud. Like, it doesn't matter if you're doing it for diastasis, recti. It doesn't matter if you're doing it because one of your eyelids won't close or because you have extra skin. It doesn't matter why right. you're doing it. it's your personal choice. And if it's going to be, if you're doing it safe and if you're being smart about it, there's absolutely nothing wrong. Exactly. And you don't need to tell anybody why or who, why are you doing it? It's nobody's exactly. business. Exactly. Exactly. So another example for me is that I've been using semaglutide to lose weight. I've lost a little over 30 pounds. Hey, thank you. I'm so happy with it. People would comment, why don't you just die and exercise? I'm like, I don't have to respond to that. Like it's really literally none of your business, what I'm doing, like how I'm doing it. I'm telling you guys, because I am open about this and I don't like to gatekeep. And I want you guys to know that this is what people might be doing. 
That being said, it's literally none of your business why I chose this instead of working out. But since we're here, I eat very healthy. I do exercise, which is why I haven't gained any weight since COVID. Like during COVID, yeah. I think whatever. everybody gained weight during COVID. I gained right. 20 pounds. I gained I 30. I struggled to get them off. I gained 30. And then after I went back to eating how I would and exercising, I stopped gaining, but I wasn't losing. And sure, I could have eaten even less and whatever, but then I was hungry and I was thinking about food all the time and it just wasn't what I wanted. Like, okay, I got on semen glutide. I'm continuing to eat well. I just eat really small portions now because I can't handle much food at one time. And I'm still working out like I was for the two years after I gained weight. Okay. So yeah, now now I'm actually losing because of the semen glutide. But at the end of the day, it's literally none of your business if I didn't want to work out. It's just, just mind yours. Like, I don't understand why you want to push your beliefs, but I do understand why, because it's really comes down to fat phobia. What they want is for people to struggle to, to earn it. They just think that people need to struggle like that. It's not fair that I'm taking a shortcut and I'm like, okay. You know what? That kind of reminds me of this uh, thing that I saw and it was talking about how like resentment or like, yeah, resentment is in the family of envy. Uh, Envy. Yeah. Envy. And it was because it's like, well, why do you get to do that? But I don't. And it's, it's this kind of underlying and I've known for a long time because I've heard it from my patients where all of a sudden they have surgery and like people start being mean to them and it's like you know mm-hmm. like this power of like well why do you now you you had surgery and I didn't have surgery and well now I hate people who have surgery or people who have surgery are taking the easy way and they're you know whatever start talking negatively right. Right. It comes from them being insecure and unhappy with themselves because it it really isn't about the surgery. It's saying they look good and I'm mad that I don't look like that or I'm not where I want to be. So I'm going to like, what is it? Not misguide, but I'm going to misdirect my feelings about my own body and put it onto someone else because I mean, because I'm jealous, right? Because I'm I'm envying that they got to where they wanted to be and I'm not where I want to be. That's what I think it is. I think that's exactly what it is. And even with men, like, what is it your business to go com- comment on me? <laughs> like, you should have just worked out. Doing? Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I know now that we have a lot of work to do more. Now I'm like, crap, we have a lot of work to do. But together, I think between all of us in the surgery community, like between you and I and a uh, surgeon made curves and the Faha doctor and all of these people, timeout massage, like all of these people in the surgery community who all we're trying to do is like really spread valuable information that women who are going through the surgery journey are looking for. Men um, and women. I want men to know y'all are getting surgery too. I see you every day. Anyway. All the time. Ab etching. The ab etching is getting the Adonis body, right? That's what Dr. John calls the the mm-hmm. male transformation. And they look good. They do. <laughs> Shout out to Drake getting it. <laughs> Have you seen him recently? I think he did it. And then he maybe he gained a little bit of weight, but then he started losing it back. Mm. Like to me. Well, we'll see if he's on semen glutide. <laughs> <laughs> what was something that as you're watching it, you're like, wait, uh oh. And then as you're watching it and you're seeing how this is being represented, how did you feel? Well, one of the things was definitely when they were making it seem like influencers being transparent is bad. And then they bring on this dermatologist who starts kind of talking about that. And you know what? She might've been taken out of context because a lot of my stuff was taken out of context, even though I still stand by everything I said in there. But they bring up this dermatologist who's like, My patients are getting younger and younger. And I just don't think people should have surgery that young. And meanwhile, she's obviously had a lot, a lot of work. And she's saying they're just looking older. And it's perpetuating this idea that anyone who has work, it's always bad or too much. And we know in the industry that the majority of people 
get very subtle work to the point where my own followers are like, what's even the point? Like, <laughs> yeah, like someone wanted to, to shave off a little bit of a, their bump on their nose or lift the tip just a little bit. That is a rhinoplasty. And they're like, well, that's not even the point. Or what's the point if we can't tell? Trust me, they can tell. And we're talking like about entire facial balancing and, and body balancing. So a little tweak here or there is going to make a big difference in the overall look without it being something like where you can just automatically, obviously tell that someone had work. So it was just really upsetting for someone who's in the industry to perpetuate the idea that everyone who gets work, it's bad and it's too much. And we know that that's not true, even when younger people do it. Another note is they were talking to a dermatologist Right. You could have been talking to a plastic surgeon. Right. And so that's another thing is that like, I'm all for like our dermatologists do great injections like that, you know, I'm not saying that they shouldn't, but they're not talking to someone who actually does BBLs, who does breast augmentations, rhinoplasties. They're only talking about someone who does Botox yeah. filler. And that's what procedure is she it. talking about? Right. And that being said, there's a lot of evidence that people who are getting Botox at a younger age, it's actually better than to wait until you already have the lines. So I don't know if she was taken out of context, but I was definitely, I was not okay with how it was presented. And that being said, they kept talking about how influencers shouldn't be, you know, talking about this stuff. They only had one physician on there, right? One, there was yeah. one? Maybe. Yeah, just one. Hey, I was like, well, who was the other one? The one with the curly hair? Was she a physician? I don't remember seeing her. There was like a redhead with like curly hair. Then there was the one who was the dermatologist. The dermatologist is the one that I remember. The right. Most. Right. I was but feeling, was, I was texting you at the same time. So maybe yeah. I missed it. No. Yeah. There was one other person. I can't remember what she was, but then there was Sheridan, who's an influencer. There's me. They had me as a med spa consultant. But I would also be a content creator too, because I, I do consulting for med spas and plastic surgery clinics. But honestly, that's a side gig to my Instagram. Then they had the Desiree girl. And then they had a pop culture writer. Obviously, I'm still bitter about this. This is the one that I have the most, just, mm, just the most fight with because she was saying none of these people should be talking about it. Of all the people on this documentary, she is the least qualified to talk about this. The dermatologist definitely has something to say. I have something to say. Sheridan and Desiree, I, I don't know. I hope I'm saying, I, I might not be saying her name correctly. It might be a different name, but like they've experienced it, whatever. The pop culture writer is the most far removed. And yet they had her on there as an expert. Ugh, what I have a bone to pick with that. I mean, who, yeah. who signed off on that? She also was using all of the buzzwords. I feel right. like she was doing it for, you know, clickbait. It's like, right. oh, that's going to be a clip that they use to market this. Right. I, I mean, I'm not saying that she shouldn't have a voice or an opinion, but they kind of put her voice as equal and maybe even above mine, maybe the dermatologist, definitely more than Sheridan and Desiree, the influencers who've actually done this. And she was saying wild things like that regular marketing companies have people's best interests and influencers don't. And I'm like, well, first of all, most of these influencers aren't getting paid to do this. They're literally just sharing their experience. And anyone who believes a marketing agency cares about your best interest, I mean, baby, you're a sucker. You're a sucker because all they're doing is selling you something bottom line to the point where we have had to make laws to protect the consumer because they were giving impossible results and impossible things. I, I've talked about this before, and this is a very basic, yeah, a very basic comparison or uh, example we literally, every time there's a mascara commercial, they have to say computer generated image because every single time they show it, they never show real lashes. They always show really ridiculously long and gorgeous and whatever lashes that have been created by a computer, not even like lash extensions. And they have to say that because they've been using that image to advertise their mascara for so long. And it's like, that's not I okay. I get my I, my eyelashes to look like that. Growing <laughs> up, 
I yeah. swear, like it works in the in the commercial. Why can't mine do right. that? And it would be really the real model with fake lashes that had been created by the computer. And so now you always see an asterisk like computer generated image, or these are not real results, computer generated image every single time. So how are you going to tell me that the marketing companies have our best interests when the United States had to make laws to say, hey, y'all stop lying. Like, come on. Come you on. know what, Dana? I think it's really important, I feel, to point out that as influencers, I feel very protective about my following and the people who you, I'm sure you feel like that too. Like I'm very protective about them. Absolutely. I don't think these marketing agencies are very protective. Well, it's because they don't have to like interface with the people. They don't have to interface with the consumers. So I have this pillow that helped me train to sleep on my back by Sleep and Glow. And I really love it. I really used it to learn to sleep on my back. I now use another pillow because I don't need it anymore. I can sleep on my back. However, it is very particular how you have to unwrap it and like squeeze it so that it incorporates the right air so it gets the right shape. Unfortunately, they don't have very clear direction. So I've gotten so many messages that people are like, my pillow doesn't look anything like yours. And so then I'm troubleshooting with them. And literally this happened just a couple of days ago. I don't know. I started my period yesterday. Maybe that was part of it. But I kind of lost it on the influencer manager. I feel really bad, Daria, if you're listening to this. I'm so sorry. I was like, I shouldn't have to be dealing with your customer service. You guys need to make better and clearer directions because these people are thinking that they're getting a shit pillow. And I know that it, it's great, but they don't know how to open it correctly so that it, it gets the shape that it needs to be because there's a film covering over there that people don't know they have to remove. There's no place. Yeah, there's no instruction that they need to remove this. And sometimes you got to squeeze it. And so literally, I was like, you need to DM this person. You need to deal with it. Like, I'm tired of having to do your customer service. It's just not fair to me. And she was like, I'm so sorry. Thank you for always whatever. I talked to my team. (laughs) I definitely went off on her because I'm protective. Like, I don't want them to think I'm selling or I'm not even selling it. But like, right, that I'm promoting a sham product. Like, no. But these marketing companies don't have that one-on-one interaction. You know, Mike at 123 Advertising doesn't have to get that message from Charlotte. Like, hey, my pillow doesn't work. From Charlotte in Ohio. Right. Like, he's not getting that message. So he can make whatever commercial, whatever advertisement he wants. And then he goes to sleep the next day and thinks about the next commercial he's going to make. And so, no, like... That's why influencing works a lot of times and in a lot of ways better and is more successful for brands than traditional media. And so, and I, you know what, Um, it's all over the place. Even on TikTok, I feel I've seen where the, the videos that get turned into ads do so much better than like thousands of dollars of production videos that are ads that don't get any traction because people want real. Like I'm tired of, don't sell me fake. Like I want real, like I buy stuff I see on TikTok all the time because like, I want, I want to use that. I want to get that. Right. right. And that's how it is. Like everybody just, we're just sharing. And we care. Like, I'm not going to say that there aren't like shit influencers who'll do whatever to make a buck. There are, there's always going to be that person. But I think that you get a really good gist of who the person is when you're following them. They're actually using something. If you've bought a couple of things and it's just not working, like obviously this person, you know, may not be telling you the whole truth, which is why I like to say like, this was gifted to me. This was an affiliate link. This is whatever, or this didn't smell that great. Like I will tell you because I would want someone to tell me. Before you make a purchase. Yeah. Right. And because we're nothing without our following, like at the end of the day, I'm only as successful as the people wanting to engage with me and see my content. So why wouldn't I want to engage back or respond to messages or make sure that the stuff that I'm promoting is doing well for other people too, right? Yeah, absolutely. I love that because I... That's exactly how I feel about my girls. I'm like, they're my girls. I'm not going to try to push something on them that's not Mm -hmm. good for them. 
I want them to get something and be super excited and for it to be like, wow, I can't believe I got this. Mommy was right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. (laughs) Your Paula's choice. I know everybody's loving that Paula's choice. Oh my gosh. So many messages that are like, okay, I bit the bullet and I got it. Like I should have known to trust you, but now I like definitely do. I'm like, thank you. And by the way, I will say, I don't really care. Paul's choice is not, they're not easy to work with. Honestly, like I don't get paid really. I don't have a sponsorship, but they made me an ambassador. They don't even pay me. I get like affiliate, like linking, which thankfully for shop my, I do better through their platform than Paul's choice own platform. Like literally I hate my part. I, I can't even call it a partnership. I hate our whatever this is that's going on, right? Or it's, yeah, like I'm not a fan. And if I didn't love their products so much, I would completely be like, don't, mm -mm, I don't care. But it sucks because I love their products and they are so backwards when it comes to influencer marketing. And I don't know. I feel like influencer marketing is kind of still catching on. Like earlier we were talking about how like with, plastic surgeons or doctors in general, like where is the the fine line, the line, yeah. right? The line of where is it too much? Where is it just enough? Where is not enough? But I think people are barely realizing the value of it. Like right. people who aren't on social media, because even people who are on social media don't even realize it, how right. impactful it is to be here about something from somebody that you trust versus just whoever. True. I will say though, that with Paula's choice, I can prove I can show and this is just from people who directly bought through my links that I've, I've helped them achieve more than $30,000 in revenue this year alone, directly through links and codes. And so that doesn't even account for all the people who saw it and then saw it at Sephora and picked it up or whatever, right. But to the point where the influencer manager was like, I had posted and there was like a significant you know, dip or not dip, I guess, increase in their sales uptick. And she was like, my boss literally was like, what happened? And she's like, let me tell you about Dana. She posted and then there was like a noticeable increase in sales. And that's when they had me on as an ambassador, which is very few PR packages. No, so they're like, we don't really do sponsorships. We'll, we'll do affiliate linking, but you have to do it through our platform, which is miserable. I mean, it's not their own platform. They're using another platform. It's really difficult to use my discount code for my followers, which is great. They get 15% off. Doesn't track. They don't track it. It doesn't get tracked. So if someone doesn't click the link, just uses the code, I don't get anything. Right. But when I use shop, my shop, my is amazing. Absolutely love it. It's like, like it to know it, but honestly, I like shop my way more. Anytime someone clicks on the link, it's it's got a pretty long memory. You know, they they're really great about tracking people using your code. And so I've reverted back to using ShopMy, even though the percentage I get is 15% instead of 20%, just because they're just so much better. And I all of that to say is that they're still getting sales because of me, even though I'm using ShopMy instead of their own platform and I'm getting less commission, it's just easier tracked. And they're like, oh. No sponsorship, no, no, nothing. Like, and I'm like, come on. You and it's literally- truly just because you love the product. Right. Truly because I love the product. And they're like, oh no, it doesn't make sense. $30,000 in a year, ma'am. Like you, like, come on. Like it does make sense. This makes sense. Like I, you have the numbers in front of you and they're like, eh, maybe, maybe small fries for them. Probably right on the world. I'm sure their numbers are, but and for them to notice an influx and then still not really. Right. No, it's just, it's that they would rather pay whatever, whatever they're paying to have like a marketing agency. Yeah. Like post an ad. On but you know, what's so funny that or something. the marketing agencies are going to be the ones reaching out to you here. Right. Soon. right. So, and they're going to be paying them more than they would be paying me to do yeah. what I already told them to do. But yeah. you know what I do like about being on Instagram is that I get to see a little bit more from brands that do care. Like I had a brand that approached me, their product wasn't something that I could 
I mean, I'm talking about plastic surgery and it was a drink that wasn't a good drink for you to be drinking during your journey. Mm -hmm. But like, I loved watching them with their audience and like really engaging with the brand, engaging with the person on the other side. And they were so cool. And I was like, man, I wish I could make this work because I love the brand. Mm -hmm. I love the drink. Like I, but I just can't because it's not appropriate for my girls. It's not appropriate for what I'm talking about. Right. But I really liked it. And I, I wish more brands would be like that where they're just as engaging with their followers on Instagram, because there's a lot of them and they're all right. out there looking. Well, and not just engaging with their followers, but also that they do look for the right influencers and making sure that, that partnership is, you know, doing well and that your connection with your followers is great. You know, the people who actually get it, they do so well with it, you know? But unfortunately, some of our favorite brands don't. And it's just a struggle because maybe at some point they will get it. But at that point, it's like, we'll see how much it'll cost you. Right. And it's <laughs> that's like, if they weren't one of my favorite brands, I honestly, this would have made me stop. So wait, um, wait, wait, before we go off, tell me your favorite products from Paula's Choice and why? What did you, what did it do to your skin? So the BHA is my absolute favorite, even though it is really just salicylic acid. It just, uh, I mean, it, there's more to it. There's more stuff in there. It just is absolutely amazing. So really quick about how I found Paula's Choice. When I was an assistant manager at a med spa, actually like six, almost seven years ago, it was like 2016. One of our patients, like she was so wealthy. So she was coming in regularly for like, all sorts of lasers, like some fillers sometimes, like all sorts of stuff regularly, like on the dot. She came in one day and she was just, she's gorgeous, by the way. She makes me think of Luann from Real Housewives in New York, like just like, oh, tall, wow. tall, like, you know, a little older, but like just looks incredible. And I was like, her name was Barbie. It's was like, Barbie, you look amazing. Like her skin was glowing. I was like, have you been going somewhere else? Like, have you been cheating on us? Like, did she have like a different, a new laser or something somewhere else? And she was like, no, girl, I've been using this amazing product, Paula's Choice BHA. And I was like, BHA, like, that's just an acid. Like, what kind, you know, I'm looking it up on the computer and it's just a salicylic acid. I'm like thinking like clean and clear, you know, like I've used salicylic acid and it did okay. Like nothing special. And she's just like, just try it, just try it. And I was like, okay, sure, whatever. So I buy the little like travel size and I use it. First of all, it says use twice a day, every day. Don't do that. No one should be using exfoliants that much. No. Uh, use it like three times a week. Maybe if you have dry skin once a week, but you know, one to three times a week. Anyway, just a couple times of using it. My skin was like glowing. I already have acne prone skin and it was like, my blackheads were gone. I was like, this is magic. This is amazing. And so from then, so since 2016, I've been a diehard Paul's Choice fan. I've used other BHAs that are, they're great. They're cool. But that is the one, one of my holy grails that I never let go of. And that's how I got there. Well, I'm going to try it. You've convinced me. <laughs> your, your influencer marketing has convinced me. <laughs> Paul's Choice, actually sponsor me. <laughs> You know, I'm not but, better or anything. <laughs> we should put the link on this episode so you can, if anybody wants to try it, they could go through your link because I want to try it. I love, I want to comment your, I can tell your weight loss on your face, on your everywhere, on your face. You look so beautiful. Your cheekbones are popping. Thank you. Thank that you. Paula's choice is working. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it's been a lot, but. I'm so happy with it. I'm I like it's been a life changer for me. I mean, also the the lipo, like shout out to Dr. Rose. He he was amazing. Everything with my bluff, like he kept my eyes still looking Arab, which was super important to me, but I just feel like my eyes look open. I'm just, I'm just over the moon with how my lipo and my weight loss has gone. So tell me about your journey with the weight loss. How what do you feel with that medication? I haven't tried it. I haven't don't have any experience with it so I would really be interested in knowing like how does it how do you feel with it like your energy levels your eating like are you hungry are you not hungry right what are you experiencing 
So what it does is it makes you feel not very hungry at all. You can't eat too much. Like it makes you feel nauseated if you, you eat it. Like I've never had bariatric surgery, but some of the feeling is like you've had bariatric surgery. Like you feel literally mm-hmm. nauseated if you eat too much. Yeah. But it also helps stave off cravings. So even people are reporting that they're smoking less, they're drinking less. It's like activating or maybe deactivating that impulse control, oh. like need, need for snacking and other just other habitual things, some even bordering on addiction things in your brain. So yeah, like there's studies that it might be helpful for alcohol addiction, things like that. Wow. Stopping smoking. Yeah. People are reporting less smoking, less drinking, less sugar cravings. I definitely crave sweets less, especially even on my period. Like I'm, that's when I crave sugar the most and crave sweets. Like I'm on my period now and I have not had a single sweet in the last couple of days since I started, which is not normal for me. And then it also helps with blood glucose control, which is why as Ozempic, it is for diabetes. It's one of the things that helps with diabetes as we go via it's for weight loss, but it even has cardioprotective properties. That being said, there are side effects like any medication, so nausea, diarrhea, things like that are your normal side effects. There's some more serious some more serious side effects, like it's possible for pancreatitis, but as soon as that happens, you just have to quit. Like your body just can't handle it. But yeah, essentially what it does is you just don't feel very hungry. You don't really have cravings. And so you're eating like small meals. You do need to focus on your, on your nutrition to make sure you are eating protein, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, things like that. But yeah, like I'm eating like a quarter of what I would normally eat throughout the day. And, and, and the weight is fast, but it's not abnormally fast. Like some people are like, it's so unhealthy to lose weight that fast. I'm losing an average of two pounds a week. That is the same as if I busted my ass in the gym. I never, never ate over my caloric limit. Like I did all the things that I needed to do. I would lose between one and three pounds a week. So it is still in that normal, healthy weight loss without me being like insane about it. So it's not like you're losing 10 pounds a week. That's not. Is there a limit to how long you can be on it? No, actually, it's even made for people to be on it long term. So basically, you're on it until you get to your goal, then you have to wean off and then you manage it through manage your weight through diet and exercise, which like I said, I was maintaining my weight with how I was eating and exercising. I just wasn't losing. Maintaining is so much easier than losing. However, if you have any sort of condition that makes it harder for you to maintain your weight, such as PCOS, such as diabetes, if you were very, and I'm going to use this in quotes, obese, like your BMI was well over 35, there are a lot of other confounding factors that make it difficult for you to maintain weight. You are recommended to be on a low or moderate dose depending on your body long term. But like for me, I've already said this, did it for vanity, didn't want to be hungry. Like I have no medical conditions. I can maintain my weight. I will wean off of it when I get to my goal, which is very soon. And then maintain that way. Yeah, PCOS or something. So you'll stay on a low dose or it's recommended that you stay on a low dose. What's the amount of weight loss, Max? Like, you know how everything kind of has like a this is indicated to lose like this amount of pounds and this is indicated to lose like this amount of pounds. Like for somebody, especially for our listeners or my listeners who are on their plastic surgery journey, and sometimes they have some weight loss to lose get weight. to to get to their uh, surgery. There isn't actually an indication, but there is an average, which is about 15 to 20% of your body weight. But it only was approved as a weight loss medication in 2021 when we think about Wagovi as semaglutide, as liraglutide, which is Saxenda, that was approved maybe, what, six years before that. So your average is about 15% of your body weight. However, if you are working, like you're really working towards lose, losing mm-hmm. weight, it's possible to lose more. But Okay. Yeah. And they can get it at their spas, right? Like it's something that can a medical provider can prescribe. Yeah, if they're getting it compounded. So I get it compounded. There is a lot of things you do need to think about when you're getting a compounded medication. I mean, we're all 
compounded medications are healthy, like safe. They're just at a pharma- they're the yeah. pharmacy that makes it for you. Yeah. Instead of it being the brand name drug, et cetera. So where it's like towing the line of whether it's legal or not, is that semaglutide as of Zempic and Wagovi, they have a patent on it. So what these compounding pharmacies are doing are compounding, like attaching it to B12 or cobalamin or to L-carnitine or something like that, which is still very safe. It's basically just a very basic supplement. They're compounding it to bypass the patent. Oh, okay. right? So most of the real issue with it is that it might be violating patent rights. But in my opinion, fuck companies that are gatekeeping life-saving medications and life-changing medications and important medications for 20 plus years so that they can make money. So I honestly don't care that Novadisc. Yeah, I don't <laughs> care that Novadisc is losing money. I literally don't care. And honestly, they're not losing money because they're in a shortage. So whatever. But that's why I'm I was getting it through a compounding pharmacy was because, well, insurance wouldn't cover it for me. There is a shortage, et cetera. If you do it through a compounding pharmacy, you're not taking medicine away from the people who really need it or need whatever. It. Oh yeah. Cause I think I did hear that drama. Like, oh, they're yeah. easing it. And all these people are using it for weight loss. And now the people who need it don't can't get right. it. Which I want to say, it's just really awful for people to say that people who need it for weight loss don't need it because obesity is a real condition that needs to be managed and treated. And it is a hundred percent a good reason to be on it because Wagovi is literally made for obesity. Now me, I wasn't obese. So technically I'm not that person. And I, and I will own that, that I am not that person who needed it. I wanted it. And so I went through the compounding way and, you know, and I'm, and I'm fine with my decision that, but like when people are like, no diabetics need it. People who are just trying to lose weight don't. There's that whole class of people who are obese, who are just as deserving of this medication as someone who has diabetes. They both need it. Period. Yeah, for sure. And then it, it's like what we were saying earlier, like it's, it's your business. none of your business between it's between them and their doctor, period. Between them and their doctor and whoever's prescribing them the medication, it's none of your business. Honestly. Exactly. But instead of like directing the anger at the right place, which is the pharmaceutical companies. That's really, that's really where we should be targeting the conversation. Exactly. The pharmaceutical companies. I saw this video last thing before I veer off. It was like, oh, tell us about how you're, you've been selling us back this thing that we funded for you to create. Like we funded the research and then it was privately sold to a company for them to sell it back to us. us. Yes, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) Anyway, I'm so happy I got to have you on today, Dana. You were amazing. It's so beautiful. You look so great. I'm so happy to see you. Thank you. I can tell you smile all the time. I'm so happy. (laughs) And we'll have you on the show again soon. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye. If you enjoyed this episode, please go on Apple. Write me a review. It's the best way for other women who are just like you, who need help, who are looking for information, valuable information on the internet. This is how they're going to find it. So go on Apple, give me a five star review. If you love this podcast, if you want to support the podcast, the best way to support the podcast is through the website. If you need help through your journey, if you need help finding a surgeon, if you want to join the membership, if you're looking for bruise juice, you guys don't sleep on bruise juice. Y'all know I have my bruise juice 30 coupon code for y'all to use if you're having a BBL, if you're having liposuction, if you're having a tummy tuck, if you need to be using bruise juice all over your body, stop using those other brands that are not tailored for your post-op recovery. Bruise juice is formulated for your recovery. It's amazing. It nourishes your skin. It helps your fat transfer live don't sleep on bruise juice. Bruise juice 30 is the code. And don't forget new episodes every Monday. I'll see you then.